All right, we're back in objective one still, being able to find the inverse of a function. In the previous uh, video, all we, were, we did was basically define that the inverse was whenever I take two functions and I put one of them inside of the other one, cancels everything out and I just get the original input back, x back. What it does is it switches the inputs and the outputs, the x and the y. So here we're actually going to find the equation for the inverse, and it's pretty simple, okay? So, since what an inverse of a function does is switch the inputs and the outputs, the x and the y, that's pretty much what you have to do. But usually your function has a f of x in it. So step number one, let's just, just to clarify it a little bit, take the f of x out, put a y in its place. That way you don't have to keep writing f of x down a, a whole bunch, right? And now step two, what happens with your inputs and your outputs, your x and your y? They get switched. So that's exactly what you do. You s exchange the x and the y values. Okay. And then usually we write our equation y equals form. So you just finally solve that equation for y and you're done. It's very, very simple. All right? Let's, uh, let's do that. Let's try that right here. Find the inverse of, and I have myself a linear equation. So step one was, ah, get rid of the f of x, make that a y, equals a negative two-thirds x plus two. Okay? And now, uh, what do I do with the inputs and outputs? What does the inverse do? It switches them. So x is equal to negative 2 thirds y plus 2. Technically, that is the inverse. We would be done, but we don't like to write it like that. We like to have it in y equals form. So the last step is to solve this thing for y. So I'm going to subtract the 2 over. x minus 2 equals negative 2 thirds y. And in order to get rid of that negative two-thirds in front of the y, I'm just going to multiply by the reciprocal, negative three halves on both sides. So uh, I'm going to switch the sides too because I like the y to come first. So uh, over here, of course, the fraction is going to cancel out, leaving me with just y. But on the left-hand side, which is our new right-hand side, is going to be a negative three halves x. And then this negative 2 will cancel out with this 2. So the 2's will cancel. The negative will become a positive, so plus 3. So here is the inverse. So what would happen if you were to take this function and stick it in for x in that function? Well, i do that composition. Everything would cancel out, and I would get x back. Those two things should undo each other. Right? Right. Okay, so let's do it just kind of like on a generic one for a linear equation, y equals mx plus b. Let's find the inverse of that and see what's the relationship between the slopes of those two equations. Let me just back up a second. Let's look at the slopes before. This slope was negative 2 thirds and I ended up with a slope of negative 3 halves. Hmm, interesting. I wonder if that kind of thing's always gonna happen. Well, we can see that by just doing that in general. So uh, I don't have to take out a f of x, so I'm just going to replace the or switch the x and the y. So x is equal to my plus b, my. Subtract the b over, so x minus b is equal to my. Now I have to get rid of the m. So to get rid of the m, I'm just going to multiply by the reciprocal again. And, and I'm doing this just because it makes it a little bit easier for you to see what's going on. So 1 over m, like you would recognize slope and things like that. So um, again, switch sides. m is equal, or y is equal to, and distribute the 1 over m to both of these pieces. So I'd have 1 over m times x minus b over m. So here is our inverse of that original y equals mx plus b equation. Look at the original slope is m, and the new slope is 1 over m. What's the relationship? Slopes are reciprocals. And perhaps that makes sense to you, because if I'm multiplying by 2, in order to undo it, I have to multiply by a half. Right? I have to basically multiply by the reciprocal. And uh, that's exactly what's happening with those. 
Okay, so on, uh, on this exercise, here are three of those linear ones. For you to give a try, go ahead and find the inverse of each of those functions. Should be pretty easy. Pause the video and then come back and check. So did you think that those were simple after all? Let's take a look at your answers here. Hmm, nice coloring. Okay, so uh, whenever you go to find the inverse of a function, sure you're supposed to switch the x and the y and uh, then solve for y. But sometimes you don't have to do that if it's not a terribly complicated function. Looking at number one, it's x plus four. So does it make sense to work backwards saying that that's gotta be x minus four? And that's exactly what we get whenever we do the algebra. On number two, maybe I, I look at it in terms of what we did in the previous um, the previous slide, the previous exercise, where I know that the slopes have to be negative reciprocals. So here I have a slope of two. The new one, the inverse, has to have a slope of one half. What about the y-intercept? Let me back that up a minute. And uh, if I look at that slope, it's a negative b over the slope, negative b over m. So on this one, negative negative one makes it a positive one, and then over our slope of two, I got one half again. Or, of course, I can switch the x and the y, solve it for y, and uh, you still notice I have reciprocals as my slopes. They're not negative reciprocals, they're just reciprocals. That way, the, they're able to cancel out. Okay, so uh, as part of the definition, we said that the domain of the function has to be the same thing as the range of the inverse. Right? That's part of the definition then. Uh, but sometimes it's not always the case. Sometimes when you have a nonlinear function, anything that's not a line, you have to first limit the domain so that you can find the inverse. Or actually, so that the inverse is a function. That should be uh, a little bit more technical. So for example, this is what I mean by that. Let's say I have y equals x squared. Very simple quadratic parent function. What's its domain? Well, you can stick anything in for x that you want to. Domain's all real numbers. So switch the x and the y there. x equals y squared. And in order to get rid of the square, take the square root of both sides. Whenever you take the square root, whenever you're solving an equation, remember you always have plus or minus. So, uh, hey, look, that's actually two different equations. That's y equals the square root of x and y equals negative square root of x. It gives me two different answers. And that's not supposed to happen with the inverse. If I give you an input, or uh, I give you the original output, I'm supposed to get just one input back. But this is giving me two different answers back. So the way that I uh, solve that problem is I go back up to that original domain. So right now the domain is all real numbers. What if I limit it? What if I chop some of it off? What if I get rid of all the negative numbers and just make it x is greater than or equal to 0? In that case, well, that's going to get rid of all of the negative answers, too, for the two, uh, the two inverses down at the bottom. And I'm just left with y equals the square root of x. I won't have to worry about y equals the negative square root of x. So the domain of the original function is chopped off to just be the positive numbers and 0. And then y equals the square root of x, it's range is also going to be the same exact thing. So now they'll match up. Okay, so <clears throat> I, I could also just, uh, instead of saying I want the positives, what if I kept the negatives? It works exactly the same way. And uh, I would get rid of y equals the square root x and keep y equals the negative square root x. We're going to examine these examples again whenever we talk about objective two being able to uh, Look at the graphs of inverses and tie those two things together. Okay, so let's, this last exercise for this objective, find some inverses of these nonlinear functions. If I look at number one, its domain is limited. X is greater than or equal to zero. We'll see why in just a second. So I'm going to take out that f of x and make that y is equal to x to the sixth, and then switch them. X equals y to the sixth. To get rid of that sixth power, I have to take the sixth root. And whenever I take an even root in the process of solving an equation, I'm supposed to have two answers, a plus and a minus. So y should be equal to 
plus or minus the sixth root of x. Again, I have a problem. I shouldn't have two answers, I should just have one. That's why I had to limit this domain and say I only want the positive ones to get rid of the negatives. Y is equal to the positive sixth root of, not six, sixth root of x. And there we go. Look at number two. Number two is not limited. I wonder why that is. Let's see. Let's go ahead and put a y in the place of f of x, 1 over 27, x cubed, switch out x and y, 1 over, what is that, red? y cubed. I first have to get rid of the 27, uh, the 1 over 27 by multiplying 27 over, so 27x equals y cubed, and then take the cube root of both sides. When I take the cube root of both sides, I don't have plus or minus. That doesn't happen with odd roots, it only happens with even ones. So I'm left with y equals, now separately take the, square, the, the cube roots of each of those. So the cube root of 27 is 3, and then I have the cube root of x. I don't have plus or minus, I only get one answer, and so therefore in the original equation I didn't have to limit it. Both the domain and the range in each of these we'll see is all real numbers. So in the next objective, next video, we're going to talk about the graphs of inverses. Just as a sneak preview, just look right up above my head. The flipping math logo has something to do with that.